to welcome you to week one of a short two-week series that we're doing called A Quiet Place, uh, both in-house and online. God bless you guys. We're so glad to have you with us. I'm asking you to go with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 46. I'll get there in just a couple of moments. The concept of this uh, series was actually, the creative concept, I should say, was actually kind of taken from a, a movie. Now, I get real hesitant doing that. And, and I need you to understand, I am neither endorsing nor am I coming against. I feel like I just have to always say those things to balance that. This movie, <clears throat> it's a PG-13 movie. There's no cussing. There's actually very little dialogue in it, but there's no cussing. There's no sexual issue. There is a little bit of blood. It's a sci-fi movie, and it's called A Quiet Place. And it's kind of an interesting thought. It's John Krasinski is in it. He plays a character by the name of Lee Abbott. I feel like I'm in a tunnel or something. You're working me, though. All right. He's like, yeah, just keep talking. And his wife, Evelyn, they're, they're a married couple, and they, they're trying to raise their son and their daughter in, in, this, in this kind of post-apocalyptic world, if you will. And there are monsters that lurk in the woods. Okay? So obviously you have to suspend some, some disbelief at times for some of these things. But they're trying to raise their, their kids in a, um, a, 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 a world where safe and sound really does not work out. See, it's, it's an idea where they, they have to try and keep it as silent as possible because they're, the monsters can't see them, but they can hear them. And if they hear them, then they can attack. Does that make sense? It's kind of a weird movie. Anyways, they play board games with cloth. They, they, if they're playing a board game with dice, they roll it on the carpet. It's got to be absolutely silent. And they, they learn a lot about providing for their family in a time of, of difficulty. Now, can, let's be real for a minute. I'm thankful that none of us encounter anything like that, okay? None of us encounter that, but I think a lot of us find ourselves trying to, to live a life in a world that's full of noise and very little light, apparently, okay? Very little light. I'm, I'm just messing with you. You're doing good, Chandler. Thank you, sir. That, that there's a noisy world, right? Things can be noisy, can be distracting. We live in a world of divided politics, have you been watching the news? And, and Corona, well, I watched the news last night, and I'm going to be honest with you. I got kind of irritated. Ten minutes on the coronavirus. Wash your hands. It's flu season. There we go. All right, so there's a lot going on with that, but we, we feel like we're, we're in this nation that needs Jesus. And a lot of times we feel like the, the voice of God can be drowned out by everything going on around us our circumstances and other voices, and we've got to find that quiet place. We've got to find that quiet place in our spirits to where we can really hear from God. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me because I want to look at what exactly God says about this. Again, if you don't have a device or a Bible, it will be up on the screens as well. But Psalm 46, verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Father, I do thank you that you're an amazing God. I thank you that you're in this house right now to speak to us. I thank you that you're doing a work even as we, we've, as we stand here. I pray, God, that, that we would walk out here a little bit differently than how we came in. God, let us have an encounter with you. Let us be intentional to find the quiet place. Be with us now, Father. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. As you're seated, tell your neighbor, say, you better find the quiet place. <clears throat> This passage, I love, I love the Psalms. I love the Psalms. And this starts with an invitation to the reader. The psalmist is saying, hey, come, take a look. Come, take a look at this. Come and see the manifestation of God's delivering power. Come see what God can do. And it starts to describe it with broken bows and splintered spears and half-charred chariots covering the ground. Uh, it's, it's a battlefield. Now, I'm going to kind of go back to the movie reference for a second. In my mind, I'm picturing one of these movie scenes where it's always on a hill. The battles are always in a hill. It's cloudy. I don't know why it always works that way, but it is. 
And uh, the victorious army, they're walking through, and there's a chariot on its side that's charred, and there's smoke rising up. You know what I'm talking about? And broken weapons as they're walking and, and kind of taking in the victory. That's what I'm seeing in this idea because the, the, all of this, the, the, they're, t- they're told, come see the trophies. Come look at the goodness of God. The language, there's, a, the, there's the practical everyday application, and that would be the, the relics of Sennacherib. That was the, he was the king of Assyria. His forces have been annihilated. They've been defeated. They're torn up. But regardless of what it is, whether you're looking at it from the, the, theoretic or the, the abstract or the concrete, either way, it's a recent act of God. It's an act of God's victory. And I want you to look at it this way. Look at Psalm 46 again, verse 8, but through the Passion Translation. Everyone, look. Come and see the breathtaking wonders of God. For he brings both ruin and revival. Let that stick with you for a minute. The the imagery that's there, because what he's saying is the breathtaking wonders of God. When God shows up in your situation, when God shows up in your world and he starts to move, it is a breathtaking thing to behold. We start to see God moving, the wonders of God. Because understand this morning, when God moves, no man can stand. When God moves, no one can oppose him. What he does is he pleases. And the beautiful thing about it is God's will is driven by his mercy and his grace. You know, the book of Acts talks about the the gate beautiful. And when we were in Israel, you're going to hear me say that a lot and you're just, it's okay. But when we were there, the, we went and saw the gate beautiful. It's closed up. It's the eastern gate. It's a gate that will be opened again one day, though, because that's where the Messiah is coming back through. But as you look down, there are two small gates. On one side, it's mercy, and on one side, it's grace. We approach God because of his mercy and his grace. We approach God because he is victorious. He's already given the victory. And as you look at this, the field of history, it's been littered with broken and abandoned weapons. We see that in history. We see it in our lives. These weapons that flourished in the hands of our enemies at one point are now broken and destroyed. They're they're, they're dust. The, The things that come against you, God gives the victory in. I really feel like I'm preaching better than you're responding this morning. I want you to get it this morning. The victory that's there, God gives the victory. Where the enemy forms a weapon against you, it doesn't win. Okay, I'm going to make sure you're with me this morning. We're Pentecostal, right? Okay, we can do this. I want us to understand, God has his hand upon us. He is God. He fights for Israel and he fights for us. But here's the thing, God's warning in verse 10 is he tells the people to stop. Be still and know that I am God. And, and the, the, um, that whole idea of stop and pay attention, the language in the Hebrew is actually what you would see for a cease and desist kind of con- uh, thought. In other words, stop what you're doing and pay attention. Stop what's going on and lock in. In other words, stop looking at your battle and start looking at the victor. Stop looking at your circumstances and look at the one who brings victory. Stop looking at your finances. Stop looking at your relationships that are struggling. Stop looking at all of those things and look at the one who brings the victory. And we find that when we get in to our quiet place. When we get into his presence, he's calling us to stop fighting. Because when we do, we stop paying attention to the size of our battles and we start paying attention to the size of our God. Our battles can seem overwhelming, but when they compare to the majesty of the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to the one who was and is and is to come, he's much, much bigger. He's got you. He is God. He is the the mighty warrior, and it's all in his control. But what's amazing is you read this passage, his exaltation, all right, being lifted up to this level, it's complete in all nations and in all the earth. He's in the midst of of your difficult times, he is still God. In the midst of your difficult places, he's still God. But notice how the psalmist ends it, and I'm gonna start wrapping this back around. He ends it, verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Selah, you know what that is? Stop and think. We don't do that well as a culture, do we? That moment, to really chew on it and process it. 
Because it's bringing the idea of what came at the beginning of Psalm 46. And that idea is that, that God starts to kind of bring all of it together because he's our refuge. He's our strength. He's, scripture says he's a very present help in a time of trouble. When we're going through the difficult moments, when we're looking those difficult things in the eye, God is with us already. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Where do you find that? Where do you find that encouragement? You find that in the quiet place. You find that in the quiet place where you get in with him. When we're in trouble, we run to him. We run to his refuge. We run to the quiet place. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts out of this. In the movie, again, it's an interesting movie. It, it really is. It's, it's, it's eerie quiet because they have to stay quiet and there's no music. That's what throws you off. Because, you know, when you're watching a movie, how you have a little bit of that. There's none of that. And in that, they, they learn how to be quiet and how to wait to be safe. So what do we need to pull from that? I think it's important that we understand it's crucial for us to understand and to teach our families the importance of the quiet place. See, the world's not going to teach our kids how to be quiet and wait. The world's not going to teach our kids how to be patient and wait for the leading and the voice and the timing of God. That's only found in the quiet place. The world teaches instead instantaneous gratification. Get it and get it now. Get it now. Get it now. In a, in a social media driven world, in a wor and, and I'm on social media. I'm not against social media. But what I am saying, in a world that is constantly, hey, I'm looking at my likes. I'm looking at my shares. I'm looking at, at all of these different things. It's all about instantaneous gra gratification and go for what's good for you in your time frame. The world doesn't teach wait. The world doesn't teach get into his presence, into the quiet place and let God speak in his time. See, all through scripture, we see that, right? Moses, he had to wait for 40 years in the desert. 40 years. I was driving yesterday. I don't even remember. I was going to come pick up my kids here. And I got behind the world's slowest driver. Like, I'm pretty sure she was in drive, but I don't know that she was using any of the pedals. And it really went about two blocks and it felt about 22 miles. I did not want to wait. I would like to tell you that um, I was super spiritual and prayed blessings upon her. I didn't. I may or may not have talked to her through my windshield. Like, it's the pedal on the right. It's the long one. You know, I, I didn't want to wait that long. Moses waited 40 years years in the desert. Um, Noah, it took Noah, it was over a hundred years to build the ark. A hundred years. You start to look at it. Joshua had to wait for Moses to die. David had to wait for Saul to be done. Jesus himself waited 30 years to launch his ministry. And yet we don't want to wait two blocks. We don't want to wait for those moments. We've got to learn that when we get into the quiet place, the quiet place is a place of God's provision. It's a place of God's direction. And we wait for his perfect timing to become and, and to teach our family to become what he wants us to be. Process is driving everything. God is worried about your destination, but he's more worried about who you're becoming as you arrive there. Process, timing, God's perfect timing. Um... Again, when we were in Israel, I found something really, really interesting. We go and we saw Psalm 35 being personified. And here's what I mean by that. We got to go to the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. And I'm telling you, that's one of the coolest things. But as you go down there, a lot of, and it's divided, the, the women and children on one side and the men on the other side. And we had to wear, we had to wear yarmulkes. Well, I don't have much to hold on to mine. And it was windy. So I did a lot of praying like this. Okay, I took my ball cap off and put my, anyways. When they prayed, it was like this. They're praying like this. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever seen where, where, where Jews will pray like this? Psalm 35 says, let every bone, let every one of my bones, let me make sure I get this right. Every, all of my bones shall say of the Lord. All of my bones shall say of the Lord. So they feel like when they pray, it should reflect almost like a candle. You know how a candle wick will burn? That, that, so it's with their entire bodies they pray. But what I found interesting was as I started to watch that, they would then get out their Torah, their Bible the Old Testament, or their book of prayers, and they put it right in front of them like this, and they would pray like this. Now, here's what I want you to do. Everybody, put your hands in front of you like this. Come on. That's participatory. Now do this. 
Now, up against each other. Up against. Now, move back and forth and look at your hands. If you don't do it, we're making fun of you. All right, there you go. All right, now, everybody can stop because you I wish I had that on film. That was cool. Now, when you were doing that, what did you really pay attention to? Your hands. Were you paying attention to anything over here? I mean, you might see a little bit of your peripheral, but you're really locked in here. There's something to be said about what they do. The reason they do that is by doing that, all they do is they're paying attention to what they're reading, their prayers and their scriptures. Nothing else matters. When we get into the quiet place, we've got to get to that place where we can start to block everything else out and start to hear the voice of the Lord. In fact, the rabbis would take their prayer shawls and they would take their, their prayer shawls like this and bring them up over like this. And actually, when they would go into a time of prayer, they would pull their prayer shawl down like this. The reason is, again, to block everything out around them. I can't see you. You know, like a little kid who hides under the blanket, I can't see you, so you're not there. It's this idea that I'm under this and I'm focused in on the things of the Lord. It's, it's blocking things out. But you know what? That's not a, just a Jewish thing. Uh, back in the early 1900s, the revival that preceded the Assemblies of God, the Azusa Street outpouring, okay? Powerful, powerful move of God. William Seymour, an African-American gentleman, pastored the church. Now, here's the kicker. It broke down every imaginable um, racial and gender uh, lines. They were all broken out. They were broken apart. It's three and a half years, God moved so mightily in the Azusa Street revival, multiple times, people would drive, would call the, the fire department because it looked like the building was on fire for the glory of God. But William Seymour, he lived in an apartment above the sanctuary. I love you guys. I'm not interested in building something up here and living here. I'm not, okay? But William Seymour did. But when he would come down, now, when you think church, you think something like this. You need to think more like an old um, warehouse, dirt floor, cinder blocks with pieces of wood through it, and that's what they sat on. He had two fruit boxes or crates put together, and that was his pulpit. And when he would come down, he would come around to his pulpit, and I'm not kidding, he would get down in his pulpit like this, and he would stick his head in the, in the box. And church would be going on, and he would just hang out in here. Now, I've not done anything like that yet either. But he's in there, and he's praying, and he's seeking the Lord, and when he gets a word from God, he steps out and he proclaims it. Why would he do that? Because he needed to block everything else out about it. When I worship, I'm up here with my back turned to you because I don't want to worry about that. I want to worship. There's got to be some pieces in our lives where we're intentional to block out everything around us and say, God, I need to get into the, I need to get into the quiet place. I need to do away with all the distractions. I need to find a place of silence. I just did 10 seconds of silence. And some of you were like, what are we doing? What's going on? Some of you stopped scrolling on social media because it stopped. What's going on? Our stream, they're like, we lost, we lost audio. We lost audio. The thing is, that moment of silence where we can hear God's voice and block out all the distractions. Psalm 46.10, the, the passion again. Be silent and stop striving and you will see that I am God. I am the God above all the nations, and I will be exalted throughout the whole earth. But I love that. Be silent and stop. Be silent and stop your striving, and you will see that I'm God. It's when we're in the quiet place that we see God's exalted over the earth. When we're in the quiet place, we see God is bigger than all of our situations. As believers, our lives should all be about giving him glory, but we're not always good about that. We may say we are, but do we, the way we live our lives or the way we lead, does it really point glory back to God or to ourselves? What drives us? I believe the problem in the church today is that we, we tend to, to not be super intentional to protect those times. We tend to not be super intentional to point back to God. But it's in the quiet place that we'll thrive. In the quiet place, we'll excel. It's in the quiet place that we'll start to become more of what God wants us to be. We talk about our vision as experiencing, connecting, and growing. You grow in the silent or in the quiet place. You grow in those moments where you're alone with God in communion with Him. And the thing is, sometimes it's a it's it's a discipline, and you don't feel anything, and that's okay. You got to be intentional with it. In the show or in the movie. 
you can see several clips where you'll see houses off in the distance with the lights on. So others have learned the value of the quiet place as well. And I think it's important, and I'm going to put it on the screen, that we understand the quiet place and its necessity so that we can thrive in his presence. We've got to understand the quiet place and its necessity, and when we do, we can thrive in his presence. 4611, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. We see right here, Jacob is our fortress. He is our strength. The, the whole military idea, he's our rampart. He's our refuge. If we abide in him, we thrive. If we abide outside of him, we struggle. Believers today, the ones that really don't follow and walk in what God has for them, it's because we're not abiding in him. We're not spending time in the quiet place. If the only word you get is a Sunday morning message, you're going to struggle. If the only time you're, you're in the presence of God is on a Sunday morning when Pastor Jason sings a song that you like, you're in trouble. He's our refuge. Look at the passion of verse 11. I love the passion version here. Here he stands, the commander. The mighty Lord of angel armies is on our side. The God of Jacob fights for us. Pause in his presence. The God of Jacob fights for our, our uh, fights on our side. You don't have to fight in your own strength. You don't have to fight in your own abilities. Why? Because the commander in chief of heaven fights for you. The king of kings, the God of angel armies, the God of Jacob fights for you. You know what I'm telling you? Understand, you don't have to worry about your marriage. Why? You can take it to the quiet place. You don't have to worry about your kids acting demon-possessed. Take them to the quiet place. You don't have to worry about your finances. Why? You can take it to the quiet place. You don't have to worry about your purpose or your hopes and dreams or whatever that might look like. Take them to the quiet place. Take them to him. Let God be your God. Let him guide you in your passions. Let him guide you in your desires. Take it to the quiet place. He wages war and lays waste to your enemies. He breaks their bow. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he fights for you. I remember when, uh, when I was a kid. Pastor Jason, if you'll go ahead and come back. I remember when I was a kid. The, the kid across the street, he probably wasn't more than about three years older than me. But I also think he started becoming a man about seven years old. So, I mean, like he was shaving in middle school. He was just a large, frightening individual. And I remember he would pick on me. He picked on me a lot. And finally, I'd had enough. You know, how, you know how you get to that point? You're like, all right, you know what? All right, I may get beat up, but game on. I'm done. Let's fight. And I remember going, and I stood up. And I was like, I'm ready to go. And all of a sudden, he's across the street, probably me to, to KC, that far from me. And, and all of a sudden, this look on his face changed. And he starts backing up. And I'm like, that's right. You don't want none of this. And he's just kind of backing up slowly. And he got about, I don't know, another 10, 15 feet away. And I went to turn around. And guess who was about 10 feet behind me? My dad. And he was looking over like, you don't want to do that. Never said a word. My dad was there. And when I envision this passage, I'm picturing God being that, bat, that dad that's behind us. And he takes the bow of the enemy. And he breaks it. He says, No. This is my child. This is my child. And my question for you this morning is, will you run to the quiet place? Will you find your rest in him? Will you teach your family to find rest in him, to find his voice, to find that place where you can thrive? Will you go to that place where you know God is God? Imagine Follow me for just a minute. Imagine what your world would look like if you found the quiet place to be a priority. What would change for your life? What would change for your family? What would change for your job? What would change for this church if the vast majority of us made that a priority? What would change in this community? It's significant. Here's what we're gonna do to wrap up. We got a couple of minutes. We're gonna wrap up. I'm gonna ask the guys to go ahead and pass out these cards to you guys. In just a moment, you're going to get a piece of paper like this. I'm going to ask you to take just a second 
And I'm gonna ask you to write down three names. Pray about it and write down three names. These are names of people you're gonna pray for and invite to Easter service. You're saying, you know what? Over the next two weeks, I am going to simply pray for them. Two weeks after that, I'm gonna look for a way to serve them. That could be after the trash is run, you pick up their trash can and take it up to the front or make some brownies or whatever that might look like. You're looking for a way to serve them. And then the last two weeks leading up to Easter, you'll invite them. 85% of people that that have been surveyed say, if I'm invited, I'll come to church. This is where it comes from. Easter will be a success not because of me or our team, though we will do our very best to make it happen. It'll be a success when you guys invite and bring somebody with you. So I'm gonna ask you to write down three names and we're gonna sing the song. And and as you write that down, I'm gonna ask you to come up here Just put them up on the front of the the platform here and stay in this area for just a minute because we're gonna pray over these names and we're also gonna pray for you as you are in the presence of the angel armies. Can we do that? So I'm gonna take just a moment, ask the Lord who we would have you invite and write those names down. And once you get them written down, just bring them up here and spread them right up here. Go ahead. God, in the Mid-Cities area. Lord, use us like never before. Use us like never before, Father God. A couple of things. 